وما تتوجبه الوقاية منه من تباعد اجتماعي ولعل المقارنة بين التباعد الاجتماعي المحدد لأسباب وقائية بحتة وذلك التباعد الذي اكتشفه هول في مختلف الثقافات لعل هذه المقارنة ستفتح آفاقا جديدة في تصميم الفراغات بأنواعها في المستقبل اكتشفت في هذا الكتاب أن للناس لغة غير منطوقة وربما غير مدركة يجب على المعماري أن يبحث عنها ويستعملها في تصميمه لكي يتمكن من التواصل الصحيح مع مستعملي الفراغات التي يصممها كما تعلمت أن هذه اللغة مثلها مثل اللغات المنطوقة هي لغة تتأثر بالموروث الثقافي وبالمقومات التاريخية والروحية والبيئية لكل مجتمع وأن هذه اللغة تتحدثها العمائر في شكلها الخارجي وفراغاتها الداخلية وتعبر عنها بأطوالها ومقاساتها المختلفة ويشبهها حسن فتحي بالنغمات الموسيقية التي إذا ما تناسقت أوقعت في نفس المستخدم وقع اللحن الجميل الذي يضربه وهذا يوافق ما ذهب إليه الفيلسوف الفرنسي بول فاليغي حين حينما كان يصف المدينة إذ يقول في, المد... في المدينة عمائر صامتة وأخرى تهمس وثالثة تغني وأرى أن بول فاليغي كان محظوظا في هذه المدينة التي كان يصفها لأن مدننا اليوم وللأسف فيها عمائر قد تصرخ في وجهك وقد وأخرى قد تبكي على حالها وعلى حالك ولعله من المهم في هذا المقام ذكر أهمية معرفة البعد الأنثروبولوجي للعمارة وهو ميدان أبدع فيه عملاقان أمثال بيير بورديو وغاستون باشلار فقد أوضح بيير بورديو في دراسته للبيت التقليدي القبائلي كيف أن فراغات القبائل الجزائري كيف أن فراغات هذا البيت تتوافق بنيتها مع البنية الفكرية والسيميائية والنفسية للسكان وفي تحليل مماثل يفسر لنا الفيلسوف غاستون باشلار ماهية البيت في الثقافة الفرنسية والأوروبية الغربية بصفة أعم حيث يبين الارتباط الشديد بين وظيفة الفراغ وأبعاده والمجال الحسي والإدراكي لساكني هذا المكان على سبيل المثال يشير باشلا إلى مكان الموقد وأهميته في البيت للتدفئة والطهي وكذلك أهمية الكساء لبي فهاتان الوظيفتين المهمتين لبقاء الإنسان وراحته في الجو البارد أصبحت هما المصدر للإسم الذي أعطي للسكن في اللغات الغربية اللاتينية فيقال للمسكن habitation, habitation من المصدر أبي كساء ومن الفعل أبيتي habitate يسكن كما يسمى البيت العائلي الحميم فوية أي نفس كلمة موقد المكان الدافئ الذي توقد فيه النار والذي يقوم عليه رجل البيت ويرثه فيه ابنه الذي تعلم عن أبي كيفية القيام على الموقد والاعتناء به ليكون البيت دائم الدفء وربما لهذا لهذا أشار الكاتب أنتوان دو سانتيك زوبيري على لسان بطله في رواية القلعة لسيتادل بيتنا هو الذي فيه أجد خطوات أبي أي الذي أجد فيه الدفء وأتذكر ما تعلمته وورثته عن أبي فأي بيت غير الذي فيه هذه المقومات ليس بيتا فقد يكون مكانا يعاش فيه ولكن لا يسكن فيه وتعرفت على الكتاب الثالث وأنا طالبة في السنة الثالثة في العمارة انتقلنا 700 كيلومتر جنوبا للمكوث لمدة أسبوع في منطقة وادي ميزار وكانت هذه الزيارة بمثابة تمرين ميداني تلقيناه خلال الدراسة وتعرف وادي وتعرف وادي مزار بين المعماريين بأنها مكة الحداثيين وذلك منذ أن زارها لكوربوزيه وكتب عنها ولما أوقعته في عمارته حيث تحول أسلوبه من الانترناشنال ستايل إلى النمط البروتاليزم الذي يتمثل الذي يمثله تصميمه لكنيسة غونشان التي قيل أنها كانت نتيجة إلهام نزل على لكوربوزيه عند زيارته لمسجد مقبرة سيد إبراهيم في قصر العطف وكان لكوربوزيه هو من عرف عمارة المزاب للحداثيين وكان أندري غافيرو هو من عرفه لبقية العالم وشارك في توثيق مبانيها ذات الألف عام وعمل على إدراجها في لائحة اليونسكو للتراث العالمي وأصبح كتاب 
le Mzab, une leçon d'architecture, ou le Mzab, Darson, sur l'Aimara, ou à Kharita, Ziaratina, sur le Mantika. كنا نزور المدن الصغيرة والمعروفة بالقصور ونتجول في أزقتها الضيقة ونقارن بين ما نراه ونحسه بما كتبه أندغي غابيغو في كتابه كانت أيام الأولى في وادي مزاب مثل الحلم ما أروع أن تقرأ انطباعات وتحاليل معماري مثل غافيغو على فراغات ومعالم ومفردات معمارية وتذهب لتلاقيها شخصيا وتقارن ما تقرأ على الأرض الواقع وبطريقة آنية وكلما زاد اكتشافي للعمارة المزابية ولكتاب غافيغو كلما زاد ارتباطي بها وحلمت لو مثل غافيغو وفتحي أن أحلل وأكتب على هذه العمارة وكان غافيغو يعتبر حسن فتحي أستاذه ومعلمه وكان هذا الأخير حاضرا في أهم كتابين ألفهما غافيغو فهو الذي كتب له مقدمة كتابه اللوسون دخشيتكتور درس في العمارة كما أهدى غافيغو كتابه الثاني الذي ألفه على عمارة الجزائر العاصمة إلو سيد كريالافيل إلى روح فتحي الذي رحل عنا في نفس سنة نشر الكتاب عام 1989 إذا جمع كتاب درس في العمارة هذين المعمارين المعماريين المولعين بالعمارة الشعبية والمدركين لقيمتها البيئية والثقافية والاجتماعية والاقتصادية ولكن على عكس فتح الذي حاول أن يبني ممارسة معمارية معاصرة مستمدة من العمارة النوبية في مصر اكتفى غافيغو بتوثيق وشرح عمارة ميزاب في درس في العمارة وعمارة الجزائر في لوسيد كخيالافيل وأثرت كتب وفكر غافيغو على شريحة واسعة من المعماريين من عمري ومنذ زيارتي للوادي وقراءاتي لفتح وغافيغو اخترت طريقي في عالم العمارة فصممت مشروع تخرجي في وادي مزاب وتفوقت فيه بالدرجة الأولى على دفعتي وأتمنت دراسة العليا حول نفس الموضوع ونفس الأسئلة وحققت, وحققت حلمي في الكتابة عن هذه العمارة وهذا الفكر بنشر كتابي حول المبادئ الروحية لعمارة المساجد الإباضية في وادي مزاب وجربة وعمان وما زالت هذه الاهتمامات إلى يومنا هذا هي التي تحركني في هذا التخصص شكرا على الانتباه شكرا شكرا دكتور نعيمة thank you very much for uh, your talk um, for everyone who didn't understand uh, the talk uh, but it's more or less how I mean I'm going to put it in a nutshell um, not give it as much justice as it should uh, but it more or less gave us uh, an overview uh, of the books that had changed uh, Dr. Naima's um, let's say path, um, and actually encouraged her to enter the field of architecture. Um, the books are in French, but I believe they are equivalent books in English. And they encourage, they, sorry, they encouraged me to stay in architecture. I, I, I was already there. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. All right, so um, just an FYI to all of the uh, attendees. If you look down or look up, there's an icon that has Q&A on it. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, uh, feel free to ask them in the Q&A and we will answer them live. Um, so feel free, even if it's related to a certain book um, or something uh, that the speaker had said, uh, we will try and, and answer them during the talk. Now, moving on to our next speaker, uh, we have Ms., uh, Professor Nicholas Kniebel. Um, his talk is about place book, reading and writing about architecture and the city. He is an architect and since 2009, Professor of Architectural and Urban Design at the German University of Technology in Oman, which is affiliated with uh, RWTH Aachen in Germany. He studied in Berlin, Singapore, and Delft, which is in the Netherlands, and gained professional experience in the offices of Rem Koolhaas in Rotterdam and Toyo Ito in Tokyo. Uh, Nicholas is a co-author of the Green Building Guidelines for a large oil company in Oman, and a member of the technical as well as the steering committee of the new Oman National Building Code Project, in which he recently co-authored a white paper on energy efficiency and sustainability of cities and buildings in Oman, together with experts from government, industry, and academia. Uh, Professor Nicholas, are you ready for your talk? 
Yes, uh, I'm Fantastic. ready and happy to contribute. Um, All right, so, thank so you. we'll be handing thank it you on very to much. you. Let me uh, pull up my slide. Okay, here we go. You can see a gray and yellow slide, correct? Correct. Correct. Good, okay. So, um, first of all, Dr. Naima, uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation of which for me was more a visual joy, um, uh, but the intellectual thread that binds the uh, different books together, uh, I think came across even uh, with me not understanding uh, uh, the verbal part of um, your talk, but I do hope to discuss that with you soon. So um, my part will be in English and I will also read uh, most parts of it and uh, go through some slides with you. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to this event to speak about books and architecture. At the beginning, I would like to remind us that here in Muscat, we're in a context where firstly, bookshops are rare and secondly, architects are rare. So before this background, the initiative by the Rusafa Group together with AIA to launch a speciality bookshop dedicated to art and architecture books alongside architecture oriented events in Muscat is I think all the more valuable. I was asked to share some personal thoughts about books and architecture tonight, and I chose place book as the title for this talk. The word place book, which doesn't really exist, I made it up, uh, um, links the elements of location and media in one word, and thus I think can guide us through this talk. Also, place book was the title of a series of texts that I wrote some years ago for the experimental journalism platform 60 Pages. My intention then was to write the commission 60 pages in 60 days in equal portions about places and books that I found worth highlighting. However, I got carried away and ended up only writing about places. So today I would like to add a few short pieces about books that are related to architecture and that I find worth sharing in this event. The first place is New York and the book is by Reinhard Wolf and also called New York. I grew up in a bookish house and do not remember ever having received any present from my father other than a book. Shelves full of books were around the house, but one book was simply too large to fit in and was thus always more present than others. It was Reinhard Wolf's New York, published in the early 80s, a photo essay about the beauty of the city skyscrapers with pages more than half a meter wide and high. I remember an image of the silver cap of the Chrysler building against the pale sky, or the golden roof of the life insurance building next to a black stained glass cube skyscrapers, sorry, if skyscrapers were people, this would be a portrait book. Each page brings us face to face with the crowns of the towers and we discover their real beauty is actually high up in the air. However, when I was a child, I also had the privilege to travel a lot every year to different and faraway places. Just after Wolf's book was published, we went to New York. I was 10. At that time, New York was ravaged by crime. What I remember most from the walks through some parts of Manhattan is fear. Hands were suddenly held tighter, steps accelerated, eyes looked tensely down. The beauty of the city as promised by Wolf's book was up in the sky, only a few hundred meters away but it remained invisible due to the unresolved social tensions on the ground. 
The second book I would like to talk about is from San Francisco and it's called The Integral Urban House by Helga and Bill Olkowski and Tom Javits. For the past few years, I had the privilege to participate in the discourse about sustainable architecture in various roles as an architect, educator, researcher, moderator, author, reviewer, promoter, or advisor. In university courses, construction sites, project teams, scientific committees, and advisory boards. This topic of building in a way that is not harmful to the environment and ourselves is so easy to grasp, but it is surprisingly difficult to implement. The hopes are always high, but progress is slow. Should we be frustrated if nothing much changes over the course of just a few years? Recently, I discovered or rediscovered a book that my mother must have bought in the 70s. I remembered it lying around at home when I was a child. It's called The Integral Urban House, Self-Reliant Living in the City by Helga and Bill Olkowski and Tom Javits. Here's a quote from the first paragraph of the introduction. In late 1972, the authors write, a group of architects, engineers, and biologists in the San Francisco Bay Area began meeting with the aim of joining our professional skills to create dwellings that would translate into physical form from the central principles of the emerging environmental movement. Each of us, often feeling isolated by the narrow perspective of our specialities, was looking for ways to extend and integrate ideas and practice, to teach others and contribute his or her own learning. We saw the potential of integrating principles of biology, food and energy production and the design of living space and community to create places where one might function without total dependence on an artificial centralized technology. At the same time, we saw the need for a center where people could combine theoretical and philosophical learning with practical experience in our areas of expertise, agriculture, architecture, building, engineering, biology, and natural systems. Our immediate goal became the combination of all our skills towards the design and construction of a place that would test experimental, ecologically stable, and resource conserving living systems. I deliberately read out this long quote because I find it really remarkable. Does this sound all too familiar for us. This is from 1972, the year I was born, but it could be written today. Are we really still discussing the same thing almost 50 years on? Has there not been any progress in half a century? How should we see this book as a sign of hope or despair? Sorry. No. Let me move to the third uh, book. The third place is Berlin, and the book is a book that a uh, group of students of which I was part wrote or produced more than wrote. It's called Passages, Passage. After the fall of the wall, Berlin felt like the freest place on earth. No borders, no limits, no definitions. It was a blank page onto which anybody could inscribe anything. After studying architecture for two years, we, a group of nine students, decided that we would drop out of university and instead run our own program. In our strange state of being contrarian and constructive at the same time, we hired our own professor who then in turn told us that he would do anything but teach us and rather encouraged us to embark further into the unknown. For weeks we drifted 
through all kinds of fringe topics with remote links to architecture, taking dips into sculptures, music, texts, colors, films, impromptu happenings. It was in a way all too much and over our heads, but it was enough to sense the connections between all these different fields of art. When our time was up, we had to report back to the university and prove that we had learned something in order to be allowed to re-enter the regular education system that we had left. We decided to produce a book, a book that would manifest our individual and collective explorations during this time a book that would accommodate multiple authors and allow for multiple readings. We designed a square formatted book with four spines. Each spine had the same number of square pages. The pages could be turned in any sequence from any of the four books and be combined in the central square. Thus, an almost endless combination of readings is possible through the unusual binding, this book could produce more than a single statement. It produced a collective sound, something that could only emerge from the void that Berlin offered in the early 90s. The fourth and last place that I would like to talk about and the fourth and last book is Rem Kolhas SML XL. Halfway through my studies, I looked for a new impulse. While in Berlin in the mid 90s, a stuffy ideological view of the past began to reign the architectural discourse. Dutch architecture promised a fresh pragmatic take on the questions of the future. And I thought that going to the Netherlands would be good for a change. The day I enrolled at Delft University, I stumbled into an evening lecture by Rem Kohlhaas, who, instead of showing off with his latest buildings, reflected on the questions that currently were on his mind. Is there, he asked, a concept of modernity beyond the Western model, reading out his newest essay, Singapore Songlines, as a preview to his upcoming book, SML XL. This question struck me because so far, I had only heard of the Western contemplation on how to overcome modernity, but never before had it occurred to me that the question could be asked the way that Kohlhaas put it, that there were other non-Western concepts of modernity to explore. I changed my study plans and a few months later, I was in Singapore enrolled as a student of architecture at the National University. Roaming around Singapore, I found myself in places straight out of the playbook of ultra modernist urbanism, where a degree of modernity was realized that the West had pro proposed once, but hardly ever reached. And even more so, a kind of modernity that was denounced to us by our professors as being horrific. All over Singapore, I saw these huge chunky slabs and tower blocks which were as uniform and unimaginative as they could possibly be. Positioned in rectangular order, but far apart from each other. Exactly the pattern that was presented to us architecture students in the West as a horror show of misguided urban and architectural development. But here in Singapore, the modernist concept was adapted and it worked. The modernist housing estates had a beauty and a life of their own. It was the first time that I saw an unapologetic and proud modernism. With almost no artifact older than 30 years, the Western discourses about heritage and tradition seemed far away and limited. And while the Western discourse kept looking back, Singapore kept looking to the future as this approach 
was its own tradition to keep. After half a year, I had to go to Delft to take up my courses there. On my return flight, I had a stopover in Amsterdam, went to the city and bought Ram Kohlhaas book, SML XL, which was finally published then. The book in itself was the essence of OMA's projects. With multiple narratives going on in parallel and the simultaneous juxtaposition of apparently unrelated content, the book in itself generated complexity and left it deliberately unresolved, just like Kohlhaas buildings. The book's ambition seemed to be to prove that the era of the end of the big narration is best expressed in a big book through multiple and simultaneous stories. SML XL is, I would say, the book of my generation of architects. Almost a year after I heard Rem Kolha's evening lecture, I had a chance to work in his office. To my surprise, I learned that the book SML XL was banned from the office in order for the staff not to look back, but like Singapore, keep the focus on the future. Let me end with expressing my appreciation for the initiative by the Rusafa Group and AIA to launch this bookstore and an events platform. I look forward to having access to real books again. We tend to substitute physical books by electronic books, especially in places like Muscat, where bookshops are rare and books are scarce. And all we can do is order and read online. However, we realize that the books on our digital devices don't create the same magic than they would as physical objects. This is, I think, because of a multifunctional digital devices are always distractions to escape from focusing on the actual book, while an analog book demands our full concentration. The magic of analog books is that they can pull you in. Being engrossed in a story is for me like being enclosed in a space. A space that comes and goes with reading. So good books, I think, can be like a kind of architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nicholas, for uh, the fantastic uh, ending statement. Um, so just so that everyone knows, um, this entire talk will be posted on YouTube. So if you had missed it today or missed parts of it, unfortunately, I didn't start recording parts of Dr. Naima's talk. However, um, uh, this is not the first uh, or last talk uh, that uh, AIA Middle East and Muscat Architecture Foundation will be doing in collaboration with Rusafa. So guys, stay tuned. Uh, make sure you follow AIA Middle East, Rusafa and Muscat Archite Architecture Foundation for future talks uh, related to literature. Um, and now uh, I can officially pass the mic to uh, the Rusafa team to officially launch their platform. And they will answer all the questions that a lot of you had posted on the Q&A concerning um, where this it's gonna be, who they are, um, and all the upcoming exciting things uh, that they're going to bring about. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce Mohammed, Mawadda, and Bayan. Uh, Bayan is hiding, maybe. Uh, there we go. All right, so I'll pass it on to them. And uh, before I move on um, to our Rusafa team, I'd like to thank Professor Nicholas and Dr. Naima for the time they took um, to give us a glimpse of how literature had uh, affected their lives, how it inspired them, how it changed uh, or, or molded, let's say, uh, who they are today. So thank you again. And uh, off to you, off to the Rusafa team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naima, Professor Nicholas, and Mariam. It was such a pleasant, inspiring talk. And I think you managed to cover everything we want to say. 
So I will be introducing Rosafa team and Rosafa itself. So greeting everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us today and supporting us in our initiative. So I am Mawadda and here's Muhammad and Bayan, the co-founders of Rosafa. Um, the idea uh, was born several months uh, ago when actually several months the actual Rosafa thing, but uh, before we started collecting books from several uh, source, sources from uh, tra traveling or from events and fairs, we thought of creating uh, a library that can support architects, either they were professionals or uh, uh, students to allow them to have an access to the, the books we have. If you can see a portion of, of them, it's uh, at our home library. Uh, and then on the other hand, Bayan was working on this uh, great idea of uh, bringing in curated books in uh, architecture and art specifically. So when we felt the lack of uh, deep books, we love to call them, that we connect with them, uh, we read more, not only books filled with renders or finished projects. We were looking for deeper books that um, written by architects, the author is an architect or books in literature and architecture or art. We were seeking for this as Professor Nicholas ended that Masqat lacking a lot of books. So we were thinking of bringing those book books in. Um, so we started Rosafa and we're at the beginning of our journey and we are inviting you all to join us in this journey where we will celebrate the, the beauty of knowledge that books hold within. So welcome all on board and uh, we are glad to have you all here. The mic is to Bayan. <laughs> uh, thank you Moed for introducing us. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Mariam from AIA. I'd like to thank Dr. Naima for the wonderful talk and also Professor Nicholas. And thank you for everyone who is uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I would like to share with you a brief insight on the name. What does Rosafa mean? Because we get this question asked a lot. Uh, I first came across the, the word Rosafa while reading a book by the British author Diana Dark. Uh, she wrote a book called Stealing from the Saracens, how British, uh, sorry, how Islamic architecture shaped Europe. Uh, Moedda is showing the book uh, right now. Uh, at, at, at the end of the book, she mentions the story of uh, Abdurrahman al dakhil the Umayyad prince, who was forced to, to flee his palace in Damascus in the seventh century at the age of 20. When he and his family fled the palace in Damascus, they went to Cordoba or Cordoba in Arabic, currently Spain. And there he built his uh, country estate uh, and named it Rosafa, uh, which later he turned into a role model city. And, and that palace became his sanctuary after being forced to flee his hometown. Uh, in this today and in this age, uh, I believe that or we believe that uh, sanctuary can be found not only in places, but also in our everyday objects, such as books. Uh, so that's where the idea of the name came. And I, I, I move the mic to Mohammed now. Thank you, Bian, for sharing the story behind the name of, of our startup. Uh, many thanks to our uh, two speakers, Dr. Naima, for your three favorite books. I really enjoyed the part where all of these books, all of the three books were from different languages. I mean, uh, French, Arabic, and English. Uh, this just uh, reflects how books have no, no language or no language barrier or no geography barrier. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I re really look forward to reading uh, the books. Thank you, Professor, for sharing your uh, personal uh, journey with books and your experience. I like the part where uh, you actually had an impact uh, with your colleagues in creating a book. Uh, it really sounds uh, very interesting. I hope uh, we do get a copy of that in our startup uh, to share with, uh, with the rest of our, of our audience, if possible. Uh, I think also that encourages us to create books and not only to, to share interesting books. 
So I do, I do see a trend, hopefully in Oman, where people will go into book binding, will go into creating books from, from scratch. I would also like to thank uh, our audience for tuning in so far. Uh, we had very positive messages on, on Instagram, on our social media uh, regarding the launch. They are very excited uh, regarding the titles that we have. And hopefully we can share a few titles. Um, Ibayan, if you can share uh, the websites, we'll give you a very quick tour of how the process of ordering um, a book from our uh, collection is. Uh, can you see that now, Hamid? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So our um, our website is called www.therosafa.com. So it's the name of our startup with the, uh, this is our homepage. So as soon as you enter uh, the website, it will give you a shared uh, view of the books that we have. Um, we have a menu talk regarding uh, how to contact us. Uh, what's the idea behind the startup? If you scroll below, you can uh, find a few uh, titles of the books. The prices are also located there. Uh, so if it's something that is uh, within hold, you can simply click on the book. Uh, if we take for any book, for example, and click onto that, that will give you another window, which shows a description uh, of the book. For example, here we have uh, architecture details, a visual guide. Uh, the author of the book is shown uh, with its, uh, the number of copies available. So I'd like to give you a notice that uh, our books are very uh, limited for the time being, for the soft launch. We'll continuously keep on updating the website with more books and more copies. So please stay tuned on a daily basis. Uh, we do have a description regarding uh, what does the book uh, includes, uh, basically uh, general points. Uh, and if you find that this book is suitable to add to your collection, you can simply add uh, add to cart and automatically that would be added to the cart and the process of checkout uh, then will continue. Our books are not only limited to a language, so we have both Arabic and English uh, books. Uh, we, our books are also um, available for undergraduates, so whether you're a student at university, uh, whether you're thinking to study architecture, it, they are also uh, related to graduates, uh, professionals in the industry, and the general public, whoever wants to increase their knowledge on architecture and arts. Uh, we hope to expand later on into design. So graphic design is also part of our titles. Inshallah, we'll also include our books on urban planning, interior design. Um, our books are very selective and very curated. Uh, so we add intellectual beauty, not only visual beauty to your library. So I think that is one point that uh, makes us different from the normal traditional books. We also hope that we, we deliver books that are uh, close to the, to the budgets of our audience, uh, which uh, will make them easier in of, instead of ordering um, online uh, from other, other sources. Uh, I would also to thank our uh, main strategic uh, partner, AIA Middle East Chapter, uh, run by uh, Mariam al Biroshi and Muscat. Architecture Foundation for their support. And I do hope that this continued support uh, will be continued in the future. Uh, and hopefully more talks or events related to architecture will be broadcasted through our platform. Thank you. We, we opened the mic for uh, questions uh, or concerns regarding our uh, purchases. You can also, also contact us on the website, uh, either by dropping us an email or contacting us via WhatsApp for any technical uh, technical issues regarding your order process. Thank you, Rusafa team, for your fantastic launch. So guys, uh, attendees, stay tuned. Um, I'm very, very excited. I, I just caught a glimpse of the website and I loved how it was laid out. So good job. Um, very nicely, as you said, curated books. Um, and I believe uh, since we're not keeping the Q&A um, as an open mic, we're taking the questions on the Q&A toolbar. Um, so I'll start with one um, uh, question from the attendees um, that uh, is basically, I, I believe you had already answered it, saying that if, if 
anyone who's interested in the website in knowing more titles or even suggesting titles. Uh, um, the Rusafa team is very uh, open to hearing what you want to see. Um, and maybe perhaps you've heard of books that are going to be quite beneficial to you, whether as a professional or a student or just someone interest, interested in um, the realm of design and the arts. Um, so one of, uh, uh, let's say, one of the very interesting questions that were asked uh, that I found uh, very um, intriguing, if I can find it here, um, but it's basically related to, um, uh, in your point of view, and, and this is an, a question for uh, the Rusafa team as well as uh, our speakers, if they believed, uh, if, they, if you believe that the impact of the fictional uh, or fictional readings um, can help the career of an architect. Uh, I could say something on that if you like, yeah. Okay, now it's a bit strange if I um, say something about it because I hardly ever read fiction. <laughs> so I come from a more theoretical point of view. Maybe Dr. Naima or the other participants are avid readers of fiction. In my family, they also laugh at me because I just, I simply can't get through a fiction book. Uh, but I read a lot. Anyway, um, I believe that reading fiction is beneficial um, for architects, especially beginners, because it's nothing else than training of, of imagination. You read something and you can't see more than uh, letters on white paper, but uh, a good literature creates inner images. And, and that is something, I don't know if we can call that a skill or an organ or whatever, <laughs> wherever inner images uh, are created, this is what we need when we design. So we more and more get drowned in images from, from uh, the media that we have available. And it's very difficult to create inner images, mental images uh, of spaces that we want to create um, because we're not used to, uh, and we don't have to do that because we have ready-made images available. And in that context, I think reading a story is a very good training to um, kind of warm up for imagination. But I don't do it, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't read it. <laughs> if you allow me to add uh, a little bit more to what uh, Prof. Nicola said. Sure, uh, go I, ahead. Um, I'm also like, like you, Prof. I, I don't read much of uh, fiction. Uh, now, <laughs> um, when before joining architecture, I used to read a lot actually fiction, but then you have to really catch up with a certain level of um, uh, knowledge and um, intellectual abilities so that you have really to read a lot in your field. Um, as a um, young student in architecture, if it's not started already, I agree with Prof. Nicholas again that it is good to start with, if you like fiction, it's good to start with fiction as long as you are reading and not watching something. Um, with the condition that it should be uh, a rich literature where there are a lot of description of spaces and so on. I remember in um, the previous century, literally, I used to read a lot of the books of, um, uh, for example, um, What's his name? Uh, Bain al Qasrain, uh, all these kind of, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the author, of course, it will come back. Um, he, he's got a lot of description. Uh, I mean, Malouf also has a lot of description of uh, spaces, uh, cities. Um, um, in the history as well, uh, they put you in contact with the history. It's very rich. Um, and, and this is the kind of literature. Um, I would advise to read, but um, it has to be, I think you have to be uh, selective in uh, what you are reading because um, even now there are um, books that don't deserve 
<laughs> in the fiction that don't deserve to be uh, to be read. Um, also, I agree with Prof. Nicholas in the fact that uh, taking a book and reading it is like you are um, uh, purgating all the images that you got from the media and so on, and you are in your own world doing your own uh, or building your own um, spaces. Um, um, so, so definitely, yes, with the condition that it should be um, rich, descriptive, um, informative literature. I would and like to it, add, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I just, because you, tr you really, um, of course, I didn't like at all the part about New York. I don't like New York <laughs> in your talk. But um, I loved so much what you have done in Berlin. And I noticed we were in Berlin roughly in the same time. Oh, <laughs> uh, I was there in the summer uh, 96. Um, it was um, Potsdamer Platz in, um, uh, in a building site. And um, I really was amazed by this fantastic and unique uh, city. Uh, it is also uh, a two cities in one. It was two cities in one. And um, I used to go from one side from the east to west under the uh, Brandenburger tour. And it was really a symbolic fact uh, to do so. So um, thank you for reminding me these beautiful places, the Hackerschehofer and under the Linden and all these places, beautiful, beautiful uh, city. I wanted to add one more uh, aspect about uh, reading fiction. So for, for all those who suffer from the same uh, problem like me, um, there's a remedy, you can still read poetry. Uh, you get through it much quicker and, and you have to chew on it for much longer. So I enjoy reading uh, poetry and I find it very inspiring to see how an atmosphere or a thought is constructed with a few words in a limited space and sometimes even with a given formal structure um, into which uh, the author has to uh, work. So I think reading poetry um, is also a very inspiring um, kind or, or format of uh, reading that is um, helpful for designers. Um, so I guess a lot of people are excited about um, uh, the, the speaker's opinions and, and Rusafa. So I there's a few questions for Rusafa, uh, maybe a, little, a, a few ideas brewing here and there. Uh, one of the questions is, in the future, do you plan to have an application via smartphones? Um, and what about delivery for uh, the Wilayat in Amman? I'll take that question. Uh, regarding the app, uh, our website is uh, mobile friendly. And regarding delivering to the to the wilayats in Oman, we we are currently delivering all over Oman. And someone previously asked if we have international shipping. Uh, we will have that in the in the near future, inshallah. But currently, during our soft launching, we're only delivering uh, around Oman. Okay, um, and another one as well related to Rusafa, if there are books that are not available on your website, can we pre-order them through you? Uh, we, will, uh, we were planning to receive um, um, orders as per demand. So uh, if you have a title in mind, we will try to do our best to curate that book for you as long as it's, it matches our uh, criteria, let's say. So hopefully you will uh, just contact us and we'll try to get that book. And I think that also applies to books that you already uh, present on your website and perhaps at a certain time they might not be available and the person can pre-order uh, and receive upon, uh, let's say availability, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, another one is, uh, are the books available from the writers, uh, the Omani writers who are in the field of art and architecture about Oman? Is it something that they can hope to see in the future? If we found Omani 
architect authors and, and their books are um, worth having, why not? We Our platform is opened and we can uh, display the, those books. Okay. Um, so there's a question here uh, that uh, Dr. Naima, or uh, no, actually, Professor Nicholas would like to answer. Uh, thank you, Rasafa team, uh, for giving uh, people an, ex uh, I mean, an opportunity to share their experiences with us. I have a question for both the speakers. As both of them are academic researchers, in what ways and how do they use the books they read to write their literature review chapter for academic papers, journals? It would be wonderful if they could share their experiences. Okay, um, I can go ahead. Um, I uh, have the uh, habit to scribble into my books and I have a system of scribbling. So I scribble uh, with intent and uh, systematically. And so I can find keywords, authors, uh, main statements quickly and um, so far, I can keep the overview, but um, it's coming to an end because I don't uh, work much with physical books uh, anymore. Um, but my uh, kind of um, grazing in literature is in a way, if it's uh, from, from my discipline, it's systematic. Dr. Naima? Um, yes, um, the question was about uh, how do we read or how do we prepare a literature review? Uh, I, because I have, um, I'm not very acquainted with the Q&A, so I didn't see the question at all. The question is, uh, in what ways and how do you use books uh, to, re to write literature review chapters for academic papers and journals? Um, okay, if I got well the the question, uh, first of all, when when I have a research or a paper uh, to do, I start already with having a question uh, in my mind that I want to answer, and uh, I go through different waves, uh, several consecutive waves of selecting, and once a book is selected to be read uh, for this particular uh, piece, um, of course, I don't read it from uh, uh, cover to cover. There is also a strategy to go through it. Uh, I scribble very little on my books. They are very precious. <laughs> I, I, um, I have some of them for like decades. Um, what I do is that I take a lot of notes. I write a lot. I take a lot of notes and my notes are well classified. And of course, with the... Um, the moving, I slowly moved to the to the um, to the soft copies and soft. Uh, so I have my Excel sheets. I use Mendeley for that. Um, so this is this is the way um, I um, uh, collect and keep my notes uh, handy um, when I'm doing uh, a paper. Um, I use a lot Mendeley. I use a lot Excel sheets, and of course I read. I read uh, books and I write my notes. Okay. Um, another, so I'll be, I think we'll be taking maybe five more additional questions. Um, any questions that are related to Rosafa, they can uh, create a Q&A on their website in which they can answer these questions for you. Um, and then the others uh, we can send off to our speakers. And once the video is posted on the AI Middle East YouTube channel, we will have the questions and the answers from the speakers. So the next question here for Rosafa, uh, will the general public have access to read those books? And if so, is there a physical library to read those books? Could be a good hub for designers and architects. I. I... I totally agree uh, with the physical hub um, of having those books. Currently, we are uh, working uh, online, so from our website. But hopefully, in the near future, our goal is to actually have a, a library. Of course, in our current times, uh, that restricts us with the pandemic. But uh, hopefully, in the near future, we would have a, 
a physical space, uh, not only to, to read the books, but also to have events uh, related to our mm -hmm. books. There. Um, and just to add, uh, sorry, Marie. go ahead. Uh, no, no, I'll go ahead. Just to add, we were thinking also to uh, create a borrowing system. So we know that architecture and art books are quite expensive, especially for students. So at the next stage, inshallah, we will try to introduce uh, borrowing uh, books from our existing uh, library, what we have. Okay. Um, أو هذا السؤال بالعربي في خطة لعمل مناقشة للكتب والأفكار مستقبلا بيكون شيء ممتاز للإثراء من مختلف المفاهيم من قبل القراء. Um, I, I believe I believe there there will be keep it stay tuned uh, because this is like I had mentioned before this is not the last collaboration that AIA and Muscat Architecture Foundation will have uh, with Rusafa. Uh, to bring in uh, speakers who will talk about literature and keeping fingers crossed, maybe the writers of the books. So keep your eyes peeled, your ears uh, unclogged um, for possible collaborations. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there's one question. Um, in a place like Oman, where bookshelves are rare, what literary influences do you see having more potential or any at all towards architecture? Anyone? <laughs> Again, the question. <laughs> I want to meditate on it. <laughs> <laughs> where bookshelves are rare. Yeah. What literary influences do you see as having more potential or any at all towards architecture? I can, I can only speak from my own experience. Um, so in the last years, uh, the main uh, books I read were children's books and I read them loud. I agree. And uh, they're actually fantastic, fantastic uh, pieces of art. Um, a few pages, maybe, you, you know, uh, telling a story with 20 sentences on 10 pages uh, with uh, climax, anticlimax, and in the end resolve the story somehow is a real art, almost like poetry. And, and I find the designerly aspect in, in them great. So um, these were the books that were mainly available uh, as fresh books. Um, and one book I thought about uh, putting into the review today is uh, called Fox in Socks. It's written by Dr. Seuss. Mm -hmm. I think um, Timami has heard me <laughs> using it in a lecture. Um, it's, it's a fantastic uh, inspiration for designers. And I think it works with less than 40 different words. That's all. Um, I can highly recommend Fox in Socks if you haven't read it yet. Yeah. So we, uh, go, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Naima. Oh, sorry, Maria. Dr. Seuss, very good, uh, excellent start, actually. Um, also, I would recommend for a little bit grown-ups, uh, the, the books of uh, Marco Valdo, uh, Italo Calvino, the books of Italo Calvino, the two books of uh, one Marco Valdo and the other Invisible Cities. Um, with the invisible cities, there is a link with imagination and imagine. Marco Valdo too, but uh, mostly the invisible cities. It's short, very short stories. Um, you can finish the, the book uh, in a day or two, but if you have a story per night, uh, that would, and you meditate on it, uh, that would uh, enrich a lot and trigger the, um, the skill or the organ of creativity. So I, um, I believe we can no longer take any questions as we ran out of time. Uh, however, uh, there's one interesting one. I'm gonna let slip because it looks pretty interesting. And the person has the same name as me. So I always consider this as good luck. Um, regarding poetry, I have a question in mind. How, poetry can, how can poetry be translated by the architect? Is it through creating an atmosphere or through symbolic design? 
or how is it through your experience? I'm, I'm guessing this is aimed at you, uh, Professor Nicholas, because I read about many architects like Peter Zumthor, whose work is linked to poetry in many cases. Okay, that's a hard one, hard question. Um, I think the difference between poetry and fiction is that in poetry, each word has more weight because the words are not so uh, linked. They kind of radiate more. And thus the relation between uh, the different words is more dependent on the power of the individual word than on the uh, stream of uh, the, the, the narration. And in architecture, um, I think in architecture that works with like powerful settings, maybe a strong material dimension where the architectural element itself kind of radiates uh, out um, and maybe even stands unresolved in relation to, to another element. Mm, that would be closer to poetry, I think. Um, and uh, in that sense, that, that's where I would see the kind of structural mm, relation, but um, it is a very big question that I do not dare to go deeper in at this point, I would have to think a bit long about it. But when Mariam asked me if I could send a quote or two about uh, books, I sent you one quote um, by a, a German poet that I admire very much, um, uh, Robert Gernhardt, and he was asked uh, what makes a good poem. And, and he wrote, I'll say it in German first, it's only four lines, then I'll translate it. He said, it's gut gefühlt, gut gedacht, gut gefügt, gut gemacht. Okay, that means it needs to be well sensed. You need to kind of use your emotion. Then it needs to be well thought. So you need to put in an intellectual element. Then it needs to be well joined that is craftsmanship. Um, and then it needs to be well made or well done, well made, you could rather say well executed. So the overall needs to be kind of um, co coherent and convincing. So I like this very short um, description of what makes a good poem because it includes these different dimensions and emotional and intellectual uh, kind of physical um, and, and this worldly uh, aspect. And uh, I keep this description in mind, even when it's not about poetry. I think it's a good um, description of quality. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Naima, you'd like to add something? Yes, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to add um, that uh, when the question was about can we translate poetry in architecture, um, I think we should be careful not to uh, try to interpret one by the other because I believe that architecture has its world and poetry has its world. Architecture has its techniques and poetry has its techniques. This doesn't mean they cannot, um, uh, they cannot overlap or intersect. And for me, the intersection is like the poem of Prof. Um, Nicholas, is in the sensibility. Um, and um, this reminded me, the question reminded me, uh, the book of uh, Gaston Bachelard that I cited, the philosopher that I cited, uh, La Poétique de l'Espace, the poetic of space. And Gaston Bachelard describes the poetic of space always uh, from the perspective of a culture, of a sensibility. You cannot be sensitive or sensible to um, uh, uh, words and ideas and um, uh, imagination that is outside of your culture first. You have to know what is your culture. Prof. Nicholas cited us a German poet because it, it speaks to him. It speaks to his heart, to his mind, to his dreams, to who he is. 
So you have first to know who you are, what is your culture, what is your language, the language of your heart, the language of your mind, the language of the images, the sound of the images that you do or you have or you build in your mind. And, and then read that poetry. And I think from that poetry, if you understand it or um, um, it speaks to you, you would be able as an architect to express it through your, uh, through your work uh, by creating this universe of uh, poetry, of sensibility, where, as I said in my talk, the, the space is not only um, a form and walls and material and structure and beauty, even aesthetic, but it is also, um, it has a soul and this soul you convey it uh, if you are sensible to this uh, poetry and to the language that triggers um, this, um, triggers your imagination and sensitivity. I can go on and on on this. Uh, so, so I will, I will stop. Uh, I will stop here. I hope that it, it clarified the point. Yes, th thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, we've reached the end of our Q and A. Um, I believe both uh, the Rosafa team and the speakers, um, when uh, Rosafa, ha I mean, they go through the website, they'll uh, ensure that there's a Q and A section that will answer uh, a lot of the questions that you guys had asked and probably a lot of people who visit the website would ask. Um, and on the YouTube channel, as I mentioned, we will put uh, the answered questions as well as the unanswered ones uh, with answers from our speakers, if they'd like to. Um, I have a very nice statement uh, from one of the attendees who uh, insisted that the speakers give a word of encouragement to the new generations to read more books because him as, uh, I don't know what his background is, but he, uh, he probably noticed a lot of graduates and students have, have kind of reduced um, the amount of time that they put in reading the physical book or touching a physical book uh, in that matter. Well, this, if you allow me, Nicolas, I'll go first. Um, I think that, um, as, as we said, um, the book, وَخَيْرُ الْأَنَامِ وَخَيْرُ شو يُقُلْ مُتَنَبِّي وَخَيْرُ جَلِيسٌ فِي الْأَنَامِ الْأَنَامِ كِتَابُ This is uh, this is one of the poets, um, the, the Arab poets of the Abbasid periods, uh, who is known for his boldness and his, um, um, his very fine manipulation of words. Uh, in his poetry, uh, and he describes uh, that the best companion that you have, you can have, is a book. Uh, because with a book, it opens um, new lives, new worlds. As you heard in our uh, presentations, um, with every book, you uh, uh, come into contact with people, with histories, with uh, cities. Uh, with characters, with cultures. There is no other means um, whatsoever, uh, complex and technological that you have, um, uh, which can lead you in these worlds, should you just have the patience. Yeah? It's a matter of patience to do every day uh, a bit. And uh, I will end with a small anecdote about reading. Um, I like reading a lot, but I hate reading the books of teenagers, especially the uh, kind of, um, um, what is it called? Uh, Harry Potter's and this kind of- Twilight. <laughs> and I have crazy with the Greek mythology. So, uh, with his sister, they bought the whole collection of Percy Jackson and company. And um, my son is a very, um, um, he can, uh, negotiate a lot. He has this skill. So um, he could negotiate with me to read to me every weekend, uh, every Friday on our way to our ritual date uh, to read for me two pages of Percy Jackson in exchange for him to read because I'm forcing him to read in Arabic uh, some books like Abbas Mahul and so on. Uh, and in the end, after one year, 
I got hooked to these books, so I can't wait the weekend uh, to to listen to Percy Jackson's uh, fantastic stories from my son. And this is the power of uh, of a book. You read from its small pieces, and you are taken. What if the literature is uh, profound and fantastic? Definitely, you will be trained. So patience. And Khairul Amali Adwamaha wa in Kalla. So every day a little bit. I would I would add two uh, thoughts at last uh, to this. One is I think it's really important to to stay away from from the sea of images uh, that is around us. Um, if you if you only take other people's images, then <laughs> you will never have an idea of your own. Uh, so I would like to encourage um, the uh, attendees here to stand on their own feet and, and believe that they can generate their own images and their own thoughts and their own arguments. And the second is um, through reading, of course, one gains knowledge, uh, be it fiction, nonfiction, no matter what. And the good thing about knowledge is that nobody can ever take it away from you. Fantastic closing comments. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I, I guess we lost a lot of our participants. They missed out on the best part of the talk, the q and I, I feel like the Q&A is literally where everyone actually goes through their thoughts and gets additional information from the speakers as well as uh, the Rusafa team. Um, one small uh, addition that I'd like to add, um, as part of the partnership of AIA Middle East and Rusafa, if you are a member of AIA Middle East, uh, and I encourage whoever is studying in the States or is, is in a, an American certified university, unfortunately, not everyone is, what. Anyhow, you can still become an international associate and you will be getting a 15% discount on books from Rusafa. So that's an added value for, um, for AIA um, members. And with that, I'd like to end the webinar. Um, and I would thank profusely the speakers for staying with us till a little bit past the hour, but that's okay. Uh, I think books are always the best way to uh, engage people and learn a lot from them. Um, and inshallah, in the next talks, uh, in next upcoming talks, we'll have more speakers um, share their experiences with literature. And as mentioned before, we'll uh, hopefully get in touch with some of the authors of the books and get them to talk about their books um, with our attendees. Um, I don't know if the Rosafa team would like to add any uh, final words, and with that we can we can then end the webinar. It was amazing. Thank you all for all the efforts uh, that you put for in in here, and believing in this idea. Thank you for our speakers for your valuable time and all the thoughts yeah, inspiring. So, so, so thank you all, and thank you for all the participants. All right. Thank so you. So we, with that, with go ahead, Ben. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to say thank you in addition to more this uh, words. So just an, a, a quick idea. The team has worked super hard. COVID is not easy. <laughs> um, and uh, we look forward to seeing more books and, and uh, more collaborations with Rusaf, inshallah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, have a good night, everyone. And take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Cheers.